Excerpt from Great Astronomical Discoveries. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Great Astronomical Discoveries. Purportedly from the Edinburgh Journal of Science. Actual author Richard Adams Locke. New Lunar Discoveries. Until the 10th of January, the observations were chiefly directed to the stars in the southern signs, in which, without the aid of the hydro-oxygen reflectors, a countless number of new stars and nebulae were discovered. But we shall defer our correspondence account of these to future pages, for the purpose of no longer withholding from our readers the more generally and highly interesting discoveries which were made in the lunar world and for this purpose too we shall defer dr grant's elaborate mathematical details of the corrections which sir john herschel has made in the best tables of the moon's tropical sidercal and synodic revolutions and of those phenomena of syzygies on which a great part of the established lunar theory depends it was about half past nine o'clock on the night of the tenth the moon having then advanced within four days of her mean libration that the astronomer adjusted his instruments for the inspection of her eastern limb. The whole immense power of his telescope was applied, and to its focal image about one half of the power of his microscope. On removing the screen of the latter, the field of view was covered throughout its entire area with a beautifully distinct and even vivid representation of basaltic rock. Its color was a greenish-brown, and the width of the columns, as defined by their interstices on the canvas, was invariably twenty-eight inches. No fracture whatever appeared in the mass first presented, but in a few seconds a shelving pile appeared of five or six columns width, which showed their figure to be hexagonal, and their articulations similar to those of the basaltic formation at Staffa. This precipitous shelf was profusely covered with a dark red flower, precisely similar says dr grant to the papaver rias or rose poppy of our sublunary cornfields and this was the first organic production of nature in a foreign world ever revealed to the eyes of men the rapidity of the moon's ascension or rather of the earth's diurnal rotation being nearly equal to five hundred yards in a second would have effectually prevented the inspection or even the discovery of objects so minute as these but for the admirable mechanism which constantly regulates under the guidance of the sextant the required altitude of the lens but its operation was found to be so consummately perfect that the observers could detain the object upon the field of view for any period they might desire the specimen of lunar vegetation however which they had already seen had decided a question of too exciting an interest to induce them to retard its exit. It had demonstrated that the moon has an atmosphere constituted similarly to our own, and capable of sustaining organized, and therefore most probably, animal life. The basaltic rocks continued to pass over the inclined canvas plane through three successive diameters, when a verdant declivity of great beauty appeared, which occupied two more. This was preceded by another mass of nearly the former height, at the base of which they were at length delighted to perceive that novelty, a lunar forest. The trees, says Dr. Grant, for a period of ten minutes were of one unvaried kind, and unlike any I have seen, except the largest kind of yews in the English churchyards, which they in some respects resemble. These were followed by a level green plain, which, as measured by the painted circle on our canvas of forty-nine feet, must have been more than a half a mile in breadth, and then appeared as fine a forest of firs, unequivocal firs, as I have ever seen cherished in the bosom of my native mountains. Wearied with the long continuance of these, we greatly reduced the magnifying power of the microscope, without eclipsing either of the reflectors, and immediately perceived that we had been insensibly descending as it were a mountainous district of a highly diversified and romantic character and that we were on the verge of a lake or inland sea but of what relative locality or extent we were yet too greatly magnified to determine 
on introducing the feeblest achromatic lens we possessed we found that the water whose boundary we had just discovered answered in general outline to the mare nubium of ricoli by which we detected that instead of commencing as we supposed on the eastern longitude of the planet some delay in the elevation of the great lens had thrown us nearly upon the axis of her equator however as she was a free country and we yet as not attached to any particular province and moreover because we could at any moment occupy our intended position we again slid in our magic lenses to survey the shores of the mare nubium why ricoli so termed it unless in ridicule of cleomedes i know not for fairer shores never angels coasted on a tour of pleasure a beach of brilliant white sand girt with wild castellated rocks apparently of green marble varied at chasms occurring every two or three hundred feet with grotesque blocks of chalk or gypsum and feathered and festooned at the summit with the clustering foliage of unknown trees moved along the bright wall of our apartment until we were speechless with admiration the water wherever we obtained a view of it was nearly as blue as that of the deep ocean and broke in large white billows upon the strand the action of very high tides was quite manifest upon the face of the cliffs for more than a hundred miles yet diversified as the scenery was during this and a much greater distance we perceived no trace of animal existence notwithstanding we could command at will a perspective or a foreground view of the whole mr holmes indeed pronounced some white objects of a circular form which we saw at some distance in the interior of a cavern to be bona fide specimens of a large cornu aminus but to me they appeared merely large pebbles which had been chafed and rolled there by the tides our chase of animal life was not yet to be rewarded having continued this close inspection nearly two hours during which we passed over a wide tract of country chiefly of a rugged and apparently volcanic character and having seen few additional varieties of vegetation except some species of lichen which grew everywhere in great abundance dr herschel proposed that we should take out all our lenses give a rapid speed to the panorama and search for some of the principal valleys known to astronomers as the most likely method to reward our first night's observation with the discovery of animated beings the lenses being removed and the effulgence of our unutterably glorious reflectors left undiminished we found in accordance with our calculations that our field of view comprehended about twenty-five miles of the lunar surface with the distinctness both of outline and detail which could be procured of a terrestrial object at a distance of two and a half miles an optical phenomenon which you will find demonstrated in note five this afforded us the best landscape views we had hitherto obtained and although the accelerated motion was rather too great we enjoyed them with rapture several of those famous valleys which are bounded by lofty hills of so perfectly conical a form as to render them less like works of nature than of art passed the canvas before we had time to check their flight but presently a train of scenery met our eye of features so entirely novel that dr herschel signalled for the lowest convenient gradation of movement it was a lofty chain of obelisk shaped or very slender pyramids standing in irregular groups each composed of about thirty or forty spires every one of which was perfectly square and as accurately truncated as the finest specimens of cornish crystal they were of a faint lilac hue and very resplendent i now thought that we had assuredly fallen on productions of art but dr herschel shrewdly remarked that if the lunarians could build thirty or forty miles of such monuments as these we should ere now have discovered others of a less equivocal character he pronounced them quartz formations of probably the wine-coloured amethyst pieces and promised us from these and other proofs which he had obtained of the powerful action of laws of crystallization in this planet a rich field of mineralogical study on introducing a lens 
his conjecture was fully confirmed they were monstrous amethysts of a diluted claret color glowing in the intensest light of the sun they varied in height from sixty to ninety feet though we saw several of a still more incredible altitude they were observed in a succession of valleys divided by longitudinal lines of round-breasted hills covered with verdure and nobly undulated but what is most remarkable the valleys which contain these stupendous crystals were invariably barren and covered with stones of a ferruginous hue which were probably iron pyrites we found that some of these curiosities were situated in a district elevated half a mile above the valley of the mare Fecunditatis of mayer and Riccoli, the shores of which soon hove in view but never was a name more inappropriately bestowed from dan to beersheba all was barren barren the seaboard was entirely composed of chalk and flint and not a vestige of vegetation could be discovered with our strongest glasses the whole breadth of the northern extremity of this sea which was about three hundred miles having crossed our plain we entered upon a wild mountainous region abounding with more extensive forests of larger trees than we had before seen the species of which i have no good analogy to describe in general contour they resembled our forest oak but they were much more superb in foliage having broad glossy leaves like that of the laurel and tresses of yellow flowers which hung in the open glades from the branches to the ground these mountains passed we arrived at a region which filled us with utter astonishment it was an oval valley surrounded except at a narrow opening towards the south by hills red as the purest vermilion and evidently crystallized for wherever a precipitous chasm appeared and these chasms were very frequent and of immense depth the perpendicular sections presented conglomerated masses of polygon crystals evenly fitted to each other and arranged in deep strata which grew darker in color as they descended to the foundations of the precipices innumerable cascades were bursting forth from the breasts of every one of these cliffs and some so near their summits and with such great force as to form arches many yards in diameter i never was so vividly reminded of byron's simile the tale of the white horse in the revolution at the foot of this boundary of hills was a perfect zone of woods surrounding the whole valley which was about eighteen or twenty miles wide at its greatest breadth and about thirty in length the small collections of trees of every imaginable kind were scattered about the whole of the luxuriant area and here our magnifiers blessed our panting hopes with specimens of conscious existence in the shade of the woods on the southeastern side we beheld continuous herds of brown quadrupeds having all the external characteristics of the bison but more diminutive than any species of the bos genus in our natural history its tail is like that of our bos grunians but in its semicircular horns the hump on its shoulders and the depth of its dewlap and the length of its shaggy hair it closely resembled the species to which i first compared it it had however one widely distinctive feature which we afterwards found common to nearly every lunar quadruped we have discovered namely a remarkable fleshy appendage over the eyes crossing the whole breadth of the forehead and united to the ears we could most distinctly perceive this hairy veil which was shaped like the upper front outline of a cap known to the ladies as mary queen of scots cap lifted and lowered by means of the ears it immediately occurred to the acute mind of dr herschel that this was a providential contrivance to protect the eyes of the animal from the great extremes of light and darkness to which all the inhabitants of our side of the moon are periodically subjected the next animal perceived would be classed on earth as a monster it was of a bluish lead color about the size of a goat with a head and beard like him and a single horn slightly inclined forward from the perpendicular the female was destitute of the horn and beard but had a much longer tail it was gregarious 
and chiefly abounded on the acclivitious glades of the woods in elegance of symmetry it rivalled the antelope and like him it seemed an agile sprightly creature running with great speed and springing from the green turf with all the unaccountable antics of a young lamb or kitten this beautiful creature afforded us the most exquisite amusement the mimicry of its movements upon our white painted canvas was as faithful and luminous as that of animals within a few yards of the camera obscura when seen pictured upon its tympan frequently when attempting to put our fingers upon its beard it would suddenly bound away into oblivion as if conscious of our earthly impertinence but then others would appear whom we could not prevent nibbling the herbage say or do what we would to them on examining the centre of this delightful valley we found a large branching river abounding with lovely islands and water birds of numerous kinds a species of grey pelican was the most numerous but a black and white crane with unreasonably long legs and bill were also quite common we watched their pecivorous experiments a long time in hopes of catching sight of a lunar fish but although we were not gratified in this respect we could easily guess the purpose with which they plunged their long necks so deeply beneath the water near the upper extremity of one of these islands we obtained a glimpse of a strange amphibious creature of a spherical form which rolled with great velocity across the pebbly beach and was lost sight of in the strong current which set off from this angle of the island we were compelled however to leave this prolific valley unexplored on account of clouds which were evidently accumulating in the lunar atmosphere our own being perfectly translucent but this was itself an interesting discovery for more distant observers had questioned or denied the existence of any humid atmosphere in this planet the moon being now low in her descent dr herschel inferred that the increasing refrangibility of her rays would prevent any satisfactory protraction of our labours and our minds being actually fatigued with the excitement of the high enjoyments we had partaken we mutually agreed to call in the assistance at the lens and reward their vigilant attention with congratulatory bumpers of the best east india particular it was not however without regret that we left the splendid valley of the red mountains which in compliment to the arms of our royal patron we denominated the valley of the unicorn and it may be found in blunt's map about halfway between the mare fecunditatis and the mare nectaris the nights of the eleventh and twelfth being cloudy were unfavorable to examination but on those of the thirteenth and fourteenth further animal discoveries were made of the most exciting interest to every human being we give them in the graphic language of our accomplished correspondent the astonishing and beautiful discoveries which we had made during our first night's observation and the brilliant promise which they gave of the future rendered every moonlight hour too precious to reconcile us to the deprivation occasioned by these two cloudy evenings and they were borne with strictly philosophical patience notwithstanding that our attention was closely occupied in superintending the erection of additional props and braces to the twenty-four feet lens which we found had somewhat vibrated in a high wind that arose on the morning of the eleventh the night of the thirteenth january was one of pearly purity and loveliness the moon ascended the firmament in gorgeous splendor and the stars retiring around her left her the unrivalled queen of the hemisphere this being the last night but one in the present month during which we should have an opportunity of inspecting her western limb on account of the liberation and longitude which would thence immediately ensue dr herschel informed us that he should direct our researches to the parts numbered two eleven twenty six and twenty in blunt's map and which are respectively known in the modern catalogue by the names of endemion cleomedes langrenus and patavius to the careful inspection of these and the regions between them and the extreme western rim he proposed to devote the whole of this highly favourable night 
taking then our twenty-five miles breadth of her surface upon the field of view and reducing it to a slow movement we soon found the first very singularly shaped object of our inquiry it is a highly mountainous district the loftier chains of which form three narrow ovals two of which approach each other in slender points and are united by one mass of hills of great length and elevation thus presenting a figure similar to that of a long skein of thread the bows of which have been gradually spread open from their connecting knot the third oval looks also like a skein and lies as if carelessly dropped from nature's hand in connection with the other but that which might fancifully be supposed as having formed the second bow of this second skein is cut open and lies in scattered threads of similar hills which cover a great extent of level territory the ground plan of these mountains is so remarkable that it has been accurately represented in almost every lineal map of the moon that has been drawn and in blunts which is the best it agrees exactly with my description within the grasp as it were of the broken bow of hills last mentioned stands an oval-shaped mountain enclosing a valley of an immense area and having on its western ridge a volcano in a state of terrific eruption to the northeast of this across the broken or what mr holmes called the vagabond mountains are three other detached oblong formations the largest and last of which is marked f in the catalogue and fancifully denominated the mare mortuum or more commonly the lake of death induced by a curiosity to divine the reason of so sombre a title rather than by any more philosophical motive we here first applied our hydro-oxygen magnifiers to the focal image of the great lens our twenty-five miles portion of this great mountain circus had comprehended the whole of this area and of course the two conical hills which rise in it about five miles from each other but although this breadth of view had heretofore generally presented its objects as if seen within a terrestrial distance of two and a half miles we were in this instance unable to discern these central hills with any such degree of distinctness there did not appear to be any mist or smoke around them as in the case of the volcano which we had left in the southwest, and yet they were comparatively indistinct upon the canvas. On sliding in the gaslight lens, the mystery was immediately solved. They were old craters of extinct volcanoes, from which still issued a heated, though transparent exhalation, that kept them in an apparently oscillatory or trembling motion, most unfavorable to examination." the craters of both these hills as nearly as we could judge under this obstruction were about fifteen fathoms deep devoid of any appearance of fire and of nearly a yellowish white colour throughout the diameter of each was about nine diameters of our painted circle or nearly four hundred fifty feet and the width of the rim surrounding them about one thousand feet yet notwithstanding their narrow mouths these two chimneys of the subterranean deep had evidently filled the whole area of the valley in which they stood with the lava and ashes with which it was encumbered and even added to the height if not indeed caused the existence of the oval chain of mountains which surrounded it these mountains as subsequently measured from the level of some large lakes around them averaged the height of two thousand eight hundred feet and dr herschel conjectured from this and the vast extent of their abutments which ran for many miles into the country around them that these volcanoes must have been in full activity for a million of years lieutenant drummond however rather supposed that the whole area of this oval valley was but the exhausted crater of one vast volcano which in expiring had left only these two imbecile representatives of its power i believe dr herschel himself afterwards adopted this probable theory which is indeed confirmed by the universal geology of the planet there is scarcely a hundred miles of her surface not even excepting her largest seas and lakes in which circular or oval mountainous ridges may not be easily found 
and many very many of these having numerous enclosed hills in full volcanic operation which are now much lower than the surrounding circles it admits of no doubt that each of these great formations is the remains of one vast mountain which has burnt itself out and left only these wide foundations of its ancient grandeur a direct proof of this is afforded in the tremendous volcano now in its prime which i shall hereafter notice what gave the name of the lake of death to the annular mountain i have just described was i suppose the dark appearance of the valley which it encloses and which to a more distant view than we obtained certainly exhibits the general aspect of the waters on this planet the surrounding country is fertile to excess between this circle and number two endemion which we proposed first to examine we counted not less than twelve luxuriant forests divided by open plains which waved in an ocean of verdure and were probably prairies like those of north america in three of these were discovered numerous herds of quadrupeds similar to our friends the bisons in the valley of the unicorn but of much larger size and scarcely a piece of woodland occurred in our panorama which did not dazzle our vision with flocks of white or red birds upon the wing at length we carefully explored the endemion we found each of the three ovals volcanic and sterile within but without most rich throughout the level regions around them in every imaginable production of a bounteous soil dr herschel has classified not less than thirty-eight species of forest trees and nearly twice this number of plants found in this tract alone which are widely different to those found in more equatorial latitudes of animals he classified nine species of mammalia and five of ovipara among the former is a small kind of reindeer the elk the moose the horned bear and the biped beaver the last resembles the beaver of the earth in every other respect than in its destitution of a tail and its invariable habit of walking only upon two feet it carries its young in its arms like a human being and moves with an easy gliding motion its huts are constructed better and higher than those of many tribes of human savages and from the appearance of smoke in nearly all of them there is no doubt of its being acquainted with the use of fire still its head and body differ only in the point stated from that of the beaver and it was never seen except on the borders of lakes and rivers in which it has been observed to immerse for a period of several seconds thirty degrees farther south in number eleven or cleomedes an immense annular mountain containing three distinct craters which have been so long extinguished that the whole valley around them which is eleven miles in extent is densely crowded with woods nearly to the summits of the hills not a rod of vacant land except the tops of these craters could be descried and no living creature except a large white bird resembling the stork at the southern extremity of this valley is a natural archway or cavern two hundred feet high and one hundred wide through which runs a river which discharges itself over a precipice of gray rock eighty feet in depth and then forms a branching stream through a beautiful campaign district for many miles within twenty miles of this cataract is the largest lake or rather inland sea that has been found throughout the seven and a half millions of square miles which this illuminated side of the moon contains its width from east to west is one hundred ninety eight miles and from north to south two hundred sixty six miles its shape to the northward is not unlike that of the bay of bengal and it is studded with small islands most of which are volcanic two of these on the eastern side are now violently eruptive but our lowest magnifying power was too great to examine them with convenience on account of the cloud of smoke and ashes which beclouded our field of view as seen by lieutenant drummond through our reflecting telescope of two thousand times they exhibited great brilliancy in a bay on the western side of this sea is an island fifty-five miles long of a crescent form 
crowded through its entire sweep with the most superb and wonderful natural beauties both of vegetation and geology its hills are pinnacled with tall quartz crystals of so rich a yellow and orange hue that we at first supposed them to be pointed flames of fire and they sprung up thus from smooth round brows of hills which are covered as with a velvet mantle even in the enchanting little valleys of this winding island we could often see the splendid natural spires mounting in the midst of deep green woods like church steeples in the vales of westmoreland we here first noticed the lunar palm tree which differs from that of our tropical latitudes only in the peculiarity of very large crimson flowers instead of the spadix protruded from the common calyx we however perceived no fruit on any specimens we saw a circumstance which we attempted to account for from the great theoretical extremes in the lunar climate on a curious kind of tree melon we nevertheless saw fruit in great abundance and in every stage of inception and maturity the general color of these woods was a dark green though not without occasional admixtures of every tint of our forest seasons the hectic flush of autumn was often seen kindled upon the cheek of earliest spring and the gay drapery of summer in some places surrounded trees leafless as the victims of winter it seemed as if all the seasons here united hands in a circle of perpetual harmony of animals we saw only an elegant striped quadruped about three feet high like a miniature zebra which was always in small herds on the green sward of the hills and two or three kinds of long-tailed birds which we judged to be golden and blue pheasants on the shores however we saw countless multitudes of univalve shellfish and among them some huge flat ones which all three of my associates declared to be cornu amini and i confess i was here compelled to abandon my sceptical substitution of pebbles the cliffs all along these shores were deeply undermined by tides they were very cavernous and yellow crystal stalactites larger than a man's thigh were shooting forth on all sides indeed every root of this island appeared to be crystallized masses of fallen crystals were found on every beach we explored and beamed from every fractured headland it was more like a creation of an oriental fancy than a distant variety of nature brought by the powers of science to ocular demonstration the striking dissimilitude of this island to every other we had found on these waters and its near proximity to the main land led us to suppose that it must at some time have been a part of it more especially as its crescent bay embraced the first of a chain of smaller ones which ran directly thither the first one was a pure quartz rock about three miles in circumference towering in naked majesty from the blue deep without either shore or shelter but it glowed in the sun almost like a sapphire as did all the lesser ones of whom it seemed the king our theory was speedily confirmed for all the shore of the main land was battlemented and spired with these unobtainable jewels of nature and as we brought our field of view to include the utmost rim of the illuminated boundary of the planet we could still see them blazing in crowded battalions as it were through a region of hundreds of miles in fact we could not conjecture where this gorgeous land of enchantment terminated for as the rotary motion of the planet bore these mountain summits from our view we became further remote from their western boundary we were admonished by this to lose no time in seeking the next proposed object of our search the langrenus or number twenty six which is almost within the verge of the libration in longitude and of which for this reason dr herschel entertained some singular expectations after a short delay in advancing the observatory upon the levers and in regulating the lens we found our object and surveyed it it was a dark narrow lake seventy miles long bounded on the east north and west by red mountains of the same character as those surrounding the valley of the unicorn 
from which it is distant to the southwest about 160 miles. This lake, like that valley, opens to the south upon a plain not more than 10 miles wide, which is here encircled by a truly magnificent amphitheatre of the loftiest order of lunar hills. For a semicircle of six miles these hills are riven, from their brow to their base, as perpendicularly as the outer walls of the Colosseum at Rome, but here exhibiting the sublime altitude of at least two thousand feet, in one smooth, unbroken surface. How nature disposed of the huge mass which she thus prodigally carved out, I know not, but certain it is that there are no fragments of it left upon the plain, which is a declivity without a single prominence, except a billowy tract of woodland that runs in many a wild vagary of breadth and course to the margin of the lake. The tremendous height and expansion of this perpendicular mountain, with its bright crimson front, contrasted with the fringe of forest on its brow, and the verdure of the open plain beneath, filled our canvas with a landscape unsurpassed in unique grandeur by any we had beheld our twenty-five miles perspective included this remarkable mountain the plain a part of the lake and the last graduated summits of the range of hills by which the latter is nearly surrounded we ardently wished that all the world could view a scene so strangely grand and our pulse beat high with the hope of one day exhibiting it to our countrymen in some part of our native land but we were at length compelled to destroy our picture as a whole for the purpose of magnifying its parts for scientific inspection. Our plain was, of course, immediately covered with the ruby front of this mighty amphitheatre, its tall figures, leaping cascades, and rugged caverns. As its almost interminable sweep was measured off upon the canvas, we frequently saw long lines of some yellow metal hanging from the crevices of the horizontal strata in wild network, or straight pendant branches we of course concluded that this was virgin gold and we had no assay master to prove to the contrary on searching the plain over which we had observed the woods roving in all the shapes of clouds in the sky we were again delighted with the discovery of animals the first observed was a quadruped with an amazingly long neck head like a sheep bearing two long spiral horns white as polished ivory and standing in perpendicular parallel to each other its body was like that of the deer but its forelegs were most disproportionately long and its tail which was very bushy and of a snowy whiteness curled high over its rump and hung two or three feet by its side its colours were bright bay and white in brindled patches clearly defined but of no regular form it was found only in pairs in spaces between the woods and we had no opportunity of witnessing its speed or habits but a few minutes only elapsed before three specimens of another animal appeared so well known to us that we fairly laughed at the recognition of so familiar an acquaintance in so distant a land they were neither more nor less than three good large sheep which would not have disgraced the farms of leicestershire or the shambles of leadenhall market with the utmost scrutiny we could find no mark of distinction between these and those of our native soil they had not even the appendage over the eyes which i have described as common to lunar quadrupeds presently they appeared in great numbers and on reducing the lenses we found them in flocks over a great part of the valley i need not say how desirous we were of finding shepherds to these flocks and even a man with blue apron and rolled-up sleeves would have been a welcome sight to us, if not to the sheep. But they fed in peace, lords of their own pastures, without either protector or destroyer in human shape. We at length approached the level opening of the lake, where the valley narrows to a mile in width, and displays scenery on both sides picturesque and romantic beyond the powers of a prose description imagination born on the wings of poetry could alone gather similes to portray the wild sublimity of this landscape where dark behemoth crags stood over the brows of lofty precipices 
as if a rampart in the sky and forests seemed suspended in mid-air on the eastern side there was one soaring crag crested with trees which hung over in a curve like three-fourths of a gothic arch and being of a rich crimson colour its effect was most strange upon minds unaccustomed to the association of such grandeur with such beauty but whilst gazing upon them in a perspective of about half a mile we were thrilled with astonishment to perceive four successive flocks of large winged creatures wholly unlike any kind of birds descend with a slow even motion from the cliffs on the western side and alight on the plain they were first noticed by dr herschel who exclaimed now gentlemen my theories against your proofs which you have often found a pretty even bet we have here something worth looking at i was confident that if ever we found beings in human shape it would be in this longitude and that they would be provided by their creator with some extraordinary powers of locomotion first exchange for my number d this lens being soon introduced gave us a fine half mile distance and we counted three parties of these creatures of twelve nine and fifteen in each walking erect towards a small wood near the base of the eastern precipices certainly they were like human beings for their wings had now disappeared and their attitude in walking was both erect and dignified having observed them at this distance for some minutes we introduced lens h which brought them to the apparent proximity of eighty yards the highest clear magnitude we possessed until the latter end of march when we effected an improvement in the gas burners about half of the first party had passed beyond our canvas but of all the others we had a perfectly distinct and deliberate view they averaged four feet in height were covered except on the face with short and glossy copper-coloured hair and had wings composed of a thin membrane without hair lying snugly upon their backs from the top of the shoulders to the calves of the legs the face which was of a yellowish flesh colour was a slight improvement upon that of the large orangutan being more open and intelligent in its expression and having a much greater expansion of forehead the mouth however was very prominent though somewhat relieved by a thick beard upon the lower jaw and by lips far more human than those of any species of the simia genus in general symmetry of body and limbs they were infinitely superior to the orangutan so much so that but for their long wings lieutenant drummond said they would look as well on a parade ground as some of the old cockney militia the hair on the head was a darker colour than that of the body closely curled but apparently not woolly and arranged in two curious semicircles over the temples of the forehead their feet could only be seen as they were alternately lifted in walking but from what we could see of them in so transient a view they appeared thin and very protuberant at the heel whilst passing across the canvas and whenever we afterwards saw them these creatures were evidently engaged in conversation their gesticulation more particularly the varied action of their hands and arms appeared impassioned and emphatic we hence inferred that they were rational beings and although not perhaps of so high an order as others which we discovered the next month on the shores of the bay of rainbows that they were capable of producing works of art and contrivance the next view we obtained of them was still more favourable it was on the borders of a little lake or expanded stream which we then for the first time perceived running down the valley to a large lake and having on its eastern margin a small wood some of these creatures had crossed this water and were lying like spread eagles on the skirts of the wood we could then perceive that they possessed wings of great expansion and were similar in structure to those of the bat being a semi-transparent membrane expanded in curvilineal divisions by means of straight radii united at the back by the dorsal integuments but what astonished us very much was the circumference of this membrane being continued from the shoulders to the legs 
united all the way down, though gradually decreasing in width. The wings seemed completely under the command of volition, for those of the creatures whom we saw bathing in the water spread them instantly to their full width, waved them as ducks do theirs to shake off the water, and then as instantly closed them again in a compact form. Our further observation of the habits of these creatures, who were of both sexes, led to results so very remarkable that I prefer they should first be laid before the public in Dr. Herschel's own work, where I have reason to know that they are fully and faithfully stated, however incredulously they may be received. Reader's Note. There's a line of asterisks. The three families then almost simultaneously spread their wings and were lost in the dark confines of the canvas before we had time to breathe from our paralyzing astonishment. We scientifically denominated them the Vespertilio Homo, or Man-Bat, and they are doubtless innocent and happy creatures, notwithstanding that some of their amusements would ill comport with our terrestrial notions of decorum. The valley itself we called the Ruby Coliseum, in compliment to its stupendous southern boundary, the six-mile sweep of precipices two thousand feet high and the night, or rather morning, being far advanced, we postponed our tour to Petavius, number 20, until another opportunity. We have, of course, faithfully obeyed Dr. Grant's private injunction to omit these highly curious passages in his correspondence which he wished us to suppress, although we do not perceive the force of the reason assigned for it. It is true, the omitted paragraphs contain facts which would be wholly incredible to readers who do not carefully examine the principles and capacity of the instrument with which these marvellous discoveries have been made, but so will nearly all of those which he has kindly permitted us to publish, and it was for this reason that we considered the explicit description which we have given of the telescope so important a preliminary. From these, however, and other prohibited passages, which will be published by Dr. Herschel with the certificates of the civil and military authorities of the colony, and of several Episcopal, Wesleyan, and other ministers, who, in the month of March last, were permitted, under stipulation of temporary secrecy, to visit the observatory, and become eyewitnesses of the wonders which they were requested to attest, we are confident his forthcoming volumes will be at once the most sublime in science and the most intense in general interest that ever issued from the press. End of Excerpt from Great Astronomical Discoveries by Richard Adams Locke